All right. Uh, I think I got everything going here, and screen sharing's on. Hopefully, sound is working. And so, this is part one of my presentation on the ancestral mothers of Paleolithic times. And we're going to do sort of an overview of some of the, well, really, it's the oldest that I know of that archaeology talks about uh, female icons, primarily in Eurasia. But we're going to begin with uh, one that I know of from northeastern Africa. There's a lot more to be discovered, I think, in the picture of the world civilizations. But uh, I wanted to just parenthetically start out with a word on terminology, because these are often referred to as Venus figurines. And I'm not going to use that framework at all here, because this I consider to be really narrowing concept, not only a Eurocentric concept, but even within the European framework, a uh, very patriarchal Roman idea of female, and uh, especially as a sex object, which is a lot of the concept that some of the early European scholars had of this when they discovered these images. And I think we're looking at a much, I know that we're looking at a much broader range of meanings and uh, ritual power, sacred significance, than fertility idols or sex goddesses or all these frameworks that you see so commonly used now. They're very much out of touch with what these people in these vast forest reaches of Eurasia, what their cultures might have really been about and why they focused on female icons as a central preoccupation, really, of the ancient uh, religion, the ancient spiritual tradition. So uh, with that out of the way, we can begin looking at them. And I want to start in northeastern Africa with this figure from Tantan. I've seen varying dates for it. The first time that I found this image, it was being dated to 80,000 before present, years before present. And since then, I've seen estimates of it at 250,000 years before present. And I haven't been really able to authenticate that, but I've seen it in a lot of places, which on the internet, you don't necessarily know that that's the reality. But we do have that date for another one, which is like this. Both of them, I want to go backwards for a second. Both of them have traces, of, especially this one, there's traces of red ochre on this figure. And this is a stone with a natural formation which has been slightly carved to enhance the resemblance to a human figure. And so uh, the same thing here, where we have uh, a natural shaped stone, which may have had an eye added to it here, and maybe also a neckline. And so if carved, very, very lightly carved, but just drawing on that idea <coughs> excuse me, of uh, an iconic human. So then we come over to Europe, and this is the oldest known European image that was found not that long ago at Hollerfels Cave in Germany, a piece of carved mammoth ivory, very tiny head. We're going to see a few examples like that. Huge breasts, hands curved around to the center of her body. She's clasping her, her uh, abdomen. And we also see these interesting striated patterns, which are added deliberately. You can see them around her breast, going uh, sides of her breast to up her arms. And so what is this? Well, that is the question. And, you know, there could be theories about these being stretch marks, but then why on the arms? And I really think that they are added as a ritual act, and they have some kind of significance to them. But what that is? is lost in the fields of time. This figure has been probably the most famous of all these iconic women of the Paleolithic from Willendorf. She of Willendorf, we'll call her. And you've got um, her hands reaching around to cover her breasts. They're actually resting on her breasts. And this figure, when she was discovered, in the scientific fervor of that period, 100 years ago, however long it was, 
They scrubbed her. You can see traces of red ochre embedded in her, but the protuberant parts have been scrubbed clean. And this was the scientific thing. We have to clean the dirt off of her. But in doing so, they also removed evidence, actually the fact that she had been caked with red ochre, the blood of the earth. The hematite that is the main ingredient in red ochre is like the hemoglobin, the red in our blood. And so there's really this very strong correlation. So this is the application, not just of symbolic blood, but an actual essence, this substance. And it's something that's found all over the planet and still active in some parts of the world in ceremonially painting up actual bodies as well as in Neolithic finds where you find both bones of the dead and also these iconic sacred women painted up in this way. Application of that ochre may have signified regeneration and rebirth. That seems to be the symbolism. Another thing going on here, we've got this clearly delineated vulva, which you're going to see in a lot of the other images. And we have either cornrows hair or a hat, a cap, which it does appear to look like a cap, which is pulled over the face. Or the face is, fa is really bent, the head bent over and looking down. And one of the modern theories about the shape of these figures has to do with a woman's perspective looking down at her own body and the attenuation of the legs and the invisibility of the feet on some of these figures uh, lar in large breasts and belly and buttocks based on her view. And, you know, the idea then that these would be women who had actually created these forms. And we just frankly don't know about that. But anyway, we've got three views here of her. And she's very potent, not very large, carved out of stone in this case, and uh, just extremely evocative. One of the things that's going on here is this is not an individual with a face. This is much more of a collective essence, I think, of the ancestral mothers, you know, that she represents the collectivity. And it's not about individual personality or individual features. This is much broader than that. Here's another really old one. And this is from Galgenberg in Germany out of a green stone. And we're looking at views of her both uh, from the front and the back. Uh, this appears to be the back view, I would guess. And, and dancing. So this is something that's important, too, because it's bringing through a ceremonial or a shamanic aspect of the ecstatic going on here and the, the practice of women. One, one of the assumptions that's been so persistent in analysis of this, I mean, I remember when I began my research in 1969 and looking at these Time Life coffee table books about the dawn of man, and it was all about men creating all the objects and men doing ceremony with them. And women really have been sort of pushed out of a lot of those frameworks that they were objects of a male gaze, but they weren't actors. They weren't spiritual leaders, as this figure seems to suggest in some of the other shamanic themes that I explore in my DVD, Woman Shaman, the Ancients, where you have these, we're going to see a few more other examples with the animal attributes in some of the female forms, of female icons. And so uh, here's something from France now, also pretty old. And on this one, you see the emphasis on the woman as progenitor. She's clearly pregnant here. Sometimes the figures are fat. They're not necessarily pregnant. But when you have these really protuberant bellies like this with this almost egg-like form to them, I, I do think we're looking at uh, the gestation of a child. And so, you know, also a very prominent vulva. And a lot of these, you know, the view matters so much because this is the same figure, but the color and even the form, you can't tell from the front view that the, uh, the belly is quite the same shape as what we're seeing here. But anyway, this vulva symbolism is going to come up quite a lot. Here's one from Italy, also on the older uh, side of these in the time depth. Uh, Frasassi Cave, which you can see is a beautiful cavern, it's a cathedral really, 
with stalactites and stalagmites. And we have this stone figure, again, with this very egg-like rounded belly and the arms reaching out, almost like they're holding out an offering. And it would be nice to have some other views of this. I would like to see it from the top. It looks like she might have an object held between her arms. Uh, but this is this pretty much stands alone in this pose, kind of a hieratic ceremonial pose, that I, as far as I can make out. Here's a much less impressive one, but made out of another of these stones that have been lightly carved to enhance similarity to a seated female figure. And this one's mainly about legs and buttocks. She's a red stone, so they call her the Red Woman of Maurn. These are the caves where she was found. And so the thing about the caves is they were ceremonial spaces, a uh, counter to the stereotype of cave people living in caves. They can be pretty cold and wet, actually. They are shelters from rain, true enough, but they were ceremonial spaces. And we have the cave paintings also pointing us in that direction. So now I want to move over into North Asia because this is all going on in the same time frame in the area north of Lake Baikal. This is one of the most important sites at Malta, which is not to be confused with Malta in the Mediterranean. And there are numerous carved female icons in mammoth ivory. And they were hunting woolly mammoths in this part of Siberia. Even then, cold like it is now, but it was glacial era. And they were making houses out of mammoth bones, they're probably using the skins also and some, some of these. Is it a hair or is it a hood? There's a whole question about that. But a lot of these are very small uh, ivory amulets that would have been worn or carried or held, perhaps placed on altars, and very often with the hands held to the center of the body. This one has this really beautiful face. Very evocative. And so here's some more examples of them. And here at the far end, we're looking at uh, front and back of one figurine. And so you can see some of them are faceless, others are incised with faces, hands all to the center in most of these cases, um, sometimes almost like a loop with the arms touching in the middle. The entire bottom of her body being uh, centered on the pubic triangle. And we'll see this dotted pattern along the top of the, of the pubic triangle that appears on a number of images in this show. Here's another view of some of those same figures. And so the watershed going into Lake Baikal, these settlements that we're looking at here, Malta and Buret, are also um, right along that watershed. So these are uh, geophysical qualities that gave rise, you know, people wanted to be near the fresh water. And they're taking the bones and the tusks of these mammoths and they're carving them into these female icons. There is a strong, virtually absolute preoccupation with the female form in these. And the female as this something that was very important. They're focusing on, I would say it's ancestral women, ancestral mothers. Uh, the hands to the belly tends to underline that. Uh, these are much flatter than what some of the coeval ones going on in Western Europe. Uh, this one's known as the Black Lady, or they'll call her the Black Venus, but we're not going to play that here. But this, this theme of blackness recurs in a couple places, both in Europe and Asia. This one has double face, they say. I'd like to have another view there, see how that plays out hands still to the center of her body. And these beautiful ivories. Oh, very ancient. 24,000, 26,000 before present, somewhere in that range. And some of them are stippled all over. And you have patterning, which has been speculated that's compared to the fur coats that people, that women make in Siberian cultures, even fur mosaics. So that's one way of interpreting it. You've got really strongly marked the pubic triangle, not much in the way of breasts. And then this one stippled all over her body. And this has also been speculated that actually it's not a coat, 
but it is a woman as an animal totem, that she is a being with fur all over her. And you could think that as well with this. And you can see a lot of these have little drilled holes so that they would have been worn or hung. But it's interesting because they're drilled from below. And so if they were hung, it would be upside down. This one is an example of how one single piece can look so different in, by different views, different lighting. And so you see the most detail on this and how deeply the eyes are incised here. You can hardly make that out at all. And so, you know, that's it's interesting because sometimes I've gotten confused looking at these images and then finally realizing that's the same picture. I mean, it's the same icon. It's just different photos. Well, this one especially brings out what looks like a necklace patterning there on her chest all with these very deeply grooved pubic triangles. And this groove above the pubic triangle is diagnostically female, uh, anatomically. Men tend to have a smooth direction straight down to the genitals, whereas for women there's a fold uh, there very commonly uh, where the pubic bone is sort of aligned differently. Here's a little bit of a better view. These are all different views of the same piece, and you can see more clearly here, the dotted pattern around the velvet triangle. And these patterns also show up in Southwest Asia, in Northeast Africa, in the Neolithic period. And she also looks as if she might have a necklace here. And yet more views. Some of these we've seen several versions of. Uh, this one with, again, just a very slight female genitals, beautiful face on this. You know, and, and almost an African looking face, you wonder about this, is it hair, is it human hair, or is it, uh, as some people theorize, a hood or a hat. There's another one with that very triangular uh, lower part of the body, which itself kind of re replicates the shape of the vulva, so very highly abstracted. Here she is from behind, and you've got again the hair. And here with this one as well, the, this could be the legs with a line between the legs, or you could look at the whole lower part of her body as a vulva. And the patterns on here, as far as I can tell, these are not carved by a person. These are little creatures feeding on the bones um, all through these ranges of time. And so they've left these little inscriptions all over their, all over the bodies. Here's Burit, and just a little further north, I think, from Amalta. And these are both, I think, rear views, but I wanted to have them in color, and this is what was available. Here's some others that give you front and back. You know, So you could argue for that one as being somewhat ambiguous in gender. You know, they're not as uh, strongly female uh, identified as what we've been looking at so far. And then also from Malta is this very interesting plaque carved with serpents on one side and this really dramatic spiral, dotted spiral pattern on the other, and surrounded by smaller spirals all the way around. So this opening could have been for wearing it and you know, as a protective amulet, but it could have also been for use as a bull roarer where you whirl it around and it goes, <laughs> and it's like this is a way of creating sacred space. It's a, a very powerful ceremonial act that is found in a lot of different parts of the world. So now I want to go back to Italy, which is kind of left off the radar by a lot of examinations of this. You tend to have more, you know, France and, uh, you know, than, than Southern Europe. But they do have Paleolithic figures there in great numbers. Uh, here again, you've got this egg-like pregnant-looking belly. Uh, you know, so I'm making a distinguished distinction between what are just fat women and ones that really do have this bulging belly on them. And also kind of a vertical symmetry going on here, the shape tapering at both ends. Maybe the arms are gathered over the chest 
as we've seen with some of the other figures, such as at Willendorf, but it's not really clear here. This is very abstract, except the center of the body, which is pretty naturalistic. So there's an important site in the Italian Riviera called Balzirossi, and these are limestone caves facing the Mediterranean. And they found at least 15 and maybe more. There's some dispute about the authenticity of some of them. Uh, 15 of these icons there in uh, that uh, coastal area. And as you can see, colorful, you know, made out of different colors of stone. We're going to look at some more detail. I don't think I have this one again. It looks a little bit like it's been broken through the ages. This is a front view of one we're going to see two slides from now. And this one was one of the first that I had ever seen when I be really began studying this way back 45 years ago. And you know they would call her the Venus of Malton. I thought she was from France, but in fact this is uh, the Riviera. And you've got uh, views of her from front, back, and side. You can see the non facial quality of the head. This is in the back with maybe a hood or hair. And it's almost serpentine. Or some of the shapes of these heads look less like human heads and more like animal heads, such as serpents. But very strong emphasis on the breast in a lot of these sculptures. And beautiful colored stones are being used for a lot of these. So this one is mammoth ivory. And you've got a side view. This is the one I was showing you before. Uh, that You can see a little bit more of the face on this side view. But lots of red ochre was rubbed into here. And bits of it has split away over time, uh, broken off. But um, they didn't get all the fragments back together. But that application of red ochre as a way of ceremonially increase renewal. And so we're seeing that again. And a lot of them are so smooth from handling. And they've been rubbed and held against the body and maybe worn in the clothing. But you know they could have also been handed down for many, many, many generations as precious icons. And so this smoothness is from touch over the loving touch of people over long periods of time. And get the reddishness again of this one. Some of these are described as being soapstone, and this may be part of that. And then here again, we have that, that symmetry, both on the horizontal and the vertical axis, where you've got kind of a mirror image going on from side to side, very pronounced protuberant belly, and a serpentine head, greenish stone. And others in black. And this one is also that the face has similar kind of shaping to it as the one we just saw. Not, It's just very, very smooth and abstracted. The breasts are very round and, again, rubbed. While the rest of the body, this looks like something split away. This might have been the belly, again, sticking out more than it shows now. Looks like something broke off there. But uh, one of the things about these caves, the old name for the caves is the Grimaldi Caves. And so those of you who have ever read anything by Sheikh Anta Diop, uh, the Malian uh, scholar that talks a lot about African heritages, he found out that the skeletons in these caves are of a very archaic uh, layer of time and that there are African features, the phenotype of the humans that have been found buried in the caves, really track with African features. And so we're finding these black images. And here's another one uh, also from these caves where you have, you know, they're using black stone. And the features on this also really very much in line with, with African features, similar to what he is talking about on faces. Somewhat broken here, looks like. 
So uh, that's something that real, we know, that there were these migrations out of Africa and eventually coming into Europe over time in the glacial era. But uh, that's something just to make a connection of that you, know, you had this African presence. Well, here's another figure that's not very um, clearly sculpted. Looks like the, uh, really a prominent feature, her knees and then the hands around the center of the body, just like we've been seeing in Malta and a lot of other places. Here's uh, some of the forms, the vulvic forms of these limestone caves that were sacred space uh, for these folks. And also about Tirosi. Uh, this one's pierced so that it could be worn or hung. And so again, maybe an amulet. And she has a dual nature also because you have this is the front with the breasts and lots of red ochre applied, especially around the vulva. A face, but then on the back, also a face. Somebody has put eyes and a mouth there. Here's a really beautiful, I'm not sure what this substance is. It kind of looks like amber, but I suppose it could be some kind of quartz or something. And uh, so the egg-like quality of the pregnancy here just really busts out at us like we saw in that earlier one from Montpazier in France. And you can see also traces of red ochre have been rubbed into this. And she has uh, what some people see as dual heads. We've got some other views here. Here we see her from the right, and we're seeing her here from the left. And so, you know, we don't really get a head on. It doesn't look like there's facial features on there, but they've kind of marked this. Uh, to set off the head, the face, on both sides, really. But pretty smooth. I mean, you could even look at that as a ponytail. And then, of course, this, this opening here, again, could function as a way to hang this as a pendant. Here's others out of the same substance. And you can see the ochre really clearly on this one. This is the front. Uh, not much in the way of a face. Breast the belly, kneeling posture, which we see not, not infrequently in a lot of these paleo sculptures. And then we have another human form connected to her. There's almost like a, uh, a dual quality here between these two beings. Uh, this kind of looks like a man to me. I've seen, though, this is the front view of this figure. I've seen this uh, indicated as possibly being a feline being. It's just that it seems a lot more like a human nose on, in profile than when you look at it dead on from the front. A very unusual figure. And then this one is really drenched in dualistic symbolism. And she's reversible. So we're looking at 180 degree rotation here. Well, this part with the head broken off, and you've got again breasts, the belly, the legs, terminating in, I suppose, toes. You come around to the other side, and the legs become forearms that are held up to and covering her face. And she's kneeling, again, with a large belly. So there's this switching that's happening. And this is also a pendant. You can see that it's got the uh, opening there for it to be hung. So doubling is a theme in this archaic world. And we see a lot of it in France, where this relief was carved at L'Ostel in the Dordogne Valley of southwestern France. And so you have a rather deeply grooved image of a woman who is kneeling in a birthing posture. She's actually holding her ankle. Uh, you see this a lot in, in birth imagery. You can see her breasts and her belly. And then emerging from her is another figure, as if she's giving birth to that figure. But it's not a baby. It's not the size of a baby. It's a mirror image of herself. And if you look at the overall shape, you can see that, that this is completely congruent across both the horizontal and vertical axes. And so it's almost like they say, well, the offspring of the ancestral mother is her double, is another form of her. And so that double emerges as a fully realized being. They're not, you know, the, the infant 
size, but the, like another reflection of herself. This one is another important one from that region of the Dordogne, El Lispug, and she's carved out of mammoth ivory, which has split, and so you can see there are gigantic crests that have been partly sheared away, and, you know, they just hanging right there in the middle of her body, and she, too, is uh, symmetrical, both top to bottom and from side to side. You could fold her over, and she would have been pretty much equivalent in shape. Uh, the tapering of the legs to the bottom is very characteristic of a lot of these figures, and it's been theorized that this would make it easy to just stick her in the ground, maybe in sand or on an altar, in, in some kind of soft substance that would hold her up, uh, kind of a pillar effect in a way. And so this is the view of her from the front, but she has another unique characteristic. In the rear view, you see that from her buttocks is suspended a string skirt. And these back aprons are something that we know from other more recent living cultures, although usually they're up over the buttocks and not below them. But it's kind of interesting as a ceremonial object. The string skirt is something that uh, scholar Elizabeth Barber did a lot of studies of. And she noticed this Paleolithic example and others from the Neolithic and others still from historical peri uh, areas in different parts of the world. And in fact, this is really a common theme in Aboriginal Australia. String skirts have remained part of ceremonial regalia for women right up to the present. You know, I mean, there's been a lot of culture interruption there, but this is something that's known as, as a revered part of culture. We see string skirts in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa and in the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. And in ancient Chile, there are figurines with string skirts. So there's a lot of this, as well as many living examples, various societies around the world and very much tied in with female ceremonial culture. So that's a real important link. But going back to some of these very deep reliefs carved in stone, this one was at the entrance of a cave and we're back at Losel again. And so you have the same basic form that we've been looking at in the full sculptures in the round. Looks like traces of ochre rubbed into her there. She has one hand on her belly, and the other one is holding up a horn. And a crescent horn with uh, 13 markings in it. And so a lot of feminist scholarship has looked at this and said, wow, 13 phases of the moon per year. And the whole correlation, of course, of the moon with women's blood cycles. And so lots of possible linkages there. And in fact, some of there are a, a couple of artifacts that have been marked. Alexander Marshak has, has written a lot about this. Uh, the markings were done on different occasions. In other words, somebody didn't sit there and make all the markings in one sitting. But every couple of days, they might make a couple more markings as if they were tracking a 28 or 29-day cycle of their menstrual flow. And that, of course, also tracking with the moon. So anyway, that something that comes to mind with the horn. Another thing I see with this figure is that we do have knob-headed figures that have very round faces like this, not really the same proportions as a human head. But I always ask with this figure whether this is the back of the skull, because this would be much more anatomical, and this is the jaw, with kind of an advanced jaw, and here we would be dealing again with an African profile, and that the horn would be held to her ear rather than her looking into the horn. You know, so it's a theory, which I see also going on in this image, you know, that this doesn't look like it's supposed to be hair. It looks like maybe a chin and part of the face. And so there, you know, according to that way of seeing it, she'd be looking to the left. And she also has this cap that we're seeing over and over again, or coiffure, whichever it is, uh, same basic form that we've been looking at with the very heavy, long breasts. These seem to me to be 
um, mature women, you know, they don't have the high breasts of young women. Older women are uh, a theme, and this goes back to his grandmother's ancestral women uh, focus that I see these, um, interpret these through. Another relief from Dordogne, from Le Terme Piala, and in profile and also facing straight forward. Very abstract piece. And this one from La Moutte, where you've got a sandstone piece and she hasn't she looks like one of the figurines, except she hasn't fully emerged from the stone. They're just sort of showing her there embedded in the background of sandstone with this very now this is really a sort of a button uh, shaped head, but very naturalistic the rest of the body. And somewhat some similarities with this. And this one is not certainly Paleolithic. They haven't really established the dating on her. Uh, vulva very much like that we saw already from Willendorf. And again, this featureless knob for the head. Not an individual, but more of a collectivity presence of ancestral women, the whole line. Okay, so we're going to go over now to Eastern Central Europe. Uh, this is in Czech Republic, and we have two examples of much more slender forms. Uh, I, there's another one from East a couple ones from France that are smaller like that, but I don't have them in this show yet. Looks like maybe traces of ochre rubbed into the body. Still a strong emphasis on the pubic triangle. And then here, oh, this is a very important site, Dolny Vestonich that I talk about also in the Woman Shaman DVD. And uh, this figure, you've got the belt. So uh, again, ritual belt, something that it's a thing, and then the vulva. And that's the figure. It's only just the lower part of the torso. But uh, really, on our topic of today, of the icons, this is one of the very important ones because she's not carved out of stone or ivory or wood even. She is the oldest clay ceramic fired figurine that we've ever found in the, in the world. And she is believed to have been made by a female shaman who lived aside from the main village, kind of more secluded. And instead of a regular hearth, she had built up clay walls around her fireplace so that she was actually firing clay. So look at the dates on there. This is our earliest known ceramicist. And they have various reasons for thinking of her as a shaman, including that, that uh, separate dwelling. Uh, you notice, so we can say that she probably created this figure, learned, I mean, she was, she was inventing a technology that, as far as I know, nobody else on the planet had done yet. Uh, and she's making a figurine along the same lines as the carved ones that we've seen and also the belt particularly, which we saw in the last figure, is also prominent here. She does have a navel. Well, you don't always see that on all of these figurines. And then you've got this kind of hood-like face, very abstract with almost serpentine eyes. She also did a lot of animal figurines. And so uh, in the Czech Republic, you have a lot of these figures. This is Moravani. And uh, that one on the right might be a plaster cast of it, I'm thinking. But very marked velvet triangle. And the arms are not happening. When you're looking at a piece of ivory, you know, there's not necessarily enough room to carve out all the arms. I'm not sure if that head is broken off or it was headless to begin with. But they have the same pattern. And then going to Spain for a moment, I don't know of any carved figures except for this one out of Spain. This is a site called Las Caldas in the later part of the Paleolithic. And these are four views of the same piece of carved bone. So you've got the woman with a head of a mountain goat, an ibex. Here's the horns going up. Here's her face. You can see a human lower body vulva, but she has hooves at the bottom. 
So if we are from one side, other side, and you can see it a little bit more clearly, the goat-like feet and legs and the back view. And also uh, incisions on this upper part. And this is broken. We don't have the full piece. So that association with of woman and animal, maybe a shapeshifter, possibly a medicine woman, or an ancestral figure that is associated with a clan animal, that borderline between human and animal in a lot of this uh, ancient culture. It's very common. I don't know very much about this site of Pavlov, Eastern Europe somewhere, but very interesting figure who appears to be robed, almost like a, a, a nun with her hands, you know, tucked into her cowl and her robe. No face, just this kind of pillar-like head. And you find also, this is Predmost, still in the Czech Republic area, where you've got mammoth bones being carved to look like human icons. And these seem much less gendered. I mean, you could argue that these are breasts. We'd have to see these from more angles to really make that part out. But this is an important theme that begins in the Paleolithic. And I don't have it in this show, but the use of phalangeal bones is not only found in Paleolithic Europe and across over into Asia, but also in Africa and other places. The form of the bone, the knobs that come up toward the joint, look like breasts. And so they would be taking some of those bones and enhancing them through carving and etching patterns on them to treat them as ceremonial objects representing ancestral women. That's my take on it. And then coming over to Russia, this is a site called Zaraisk. And you've got four views of the same figure. Here again, the heads look somewhat knob-like until you see them from the side. And you can see this is an upturned face with the chin pointing outward. You can see it here, too. And they're still holding their hands to the center of their belly, like so many of the others that we've been looking at. You do find outlying examples like this of younger, slender women at Yelizevich. I'm not sure if that's Russia or Ukraine. I think actually this site might be in the Kuban. I don't remember. And then Khotil Yova. And you've got the symbolism of paired women who are embracing each other. And so this is a really beautiful piece because we have that bond between women showing up. And this is a theme. I actually track this in my show on, on lesbians where you've got uh, women paired and embracing each other. All right, I think we have uh, come to the end of part one. And so if you want to look at more of this, there is still part uh, two and three. And I uh, encourage you also to visit my website, suppresshistories.net. There are articles and photo essays there, and also the daily blog that I'm running on Facebook under the Suppress Histories page. So. Uh, be sure to visit those.